Okay, uh, now what I'm going to do is for um, almost all our sessions, we'll be using a lot of R code that I will show on the slides. I'll make this R code available for you in the form of a .r file. Okay, this is what I had showed. Uh, I had shown inside uh, R Studio, right? So what you need to do is to first of all, before the class, before the session, download that file, and in fact, you know, put it into the project for that particular session, and then load the file. And as I'm going through the slides, you can step step through the same code uh, that uh, that I'm showing you. Okay, so that way you'll be able to. Uh, look at the code. In fact, periodically, what I would recommend is that you, uh, you know, stop my video, uh, take a look at the code that I've given you, uh, and you know, uh, in a separate source code window within our studio, uh, try out some variations of the code that I'm giving you. Okay, don't. There's no point in simply stepping through the code that I'm giving you and seeing the results that it produces. That's not a good use of your time. Instead, what you should do is to take a look at what it, what the code does. And then play around with it a little bit, you know. Do something, change up something, uh, and see how it works. Uh, and don't be afraid of making any mistakes. In fact, the only way you learn, especially uh, when you when it comes to programming environments, is by making mistakes. Make a mistake, see what error messages you get, see why that was a mistake, and see how you can correct it. That's really the whole learning process. So don't be afraid of making mistakes. In fact, celebrate when you when you do make a mistake. And don't take a look at a mistake and then simply throw your hands up and say, uh, you know, something has gone wrong. No, what you really need to do is to understand what has gone wrong, read the error message, understand what has gone wrong, and fix it. That's really a powerful way of learning. Okay, so don't look at an error message as something that's completely beyond your control. Uh, when the system throws an error message, it's trying to tell you that something is wrong, and it's trying to give you some information on uh, the underlying cause. Of course, I admit that many times the error messages that you see are something that uh, you know you don't really have the knowledge yet to decipher those error messages. Uh, but believe me, the more effort you make, the better you'll keep getting at this process. Okay. So the R code for every session I'll be posting on Blackboard. Uh, the code for today's session is also posted on Blackboard. You can go there. Uh, you'll find uh, the, the code posted there. Download it. Keep it in a particular directory. Make that as part of your uh, project for the particular session. Load the code, and then you can step uh, right along with what I'm doing. OK? Uh, like I said, don't be afraid to make mistakes and uh, play around. Uh, explore the code that I'm giving you. OK. So let's get started. Uh, but before that, I'm just going to show you the file that I have posted on Blackboard. Okay, so that file is actually uh, here. It's called session one code dot r. Okay, so if I click it, uh, it'll open up here, and then after that, you'll see that, uh, for example, here I have highlighted the code here. Um, this much. Okay, this is the name of the slide: managing objects in the R workspace. So if you look at my thing you see managing objects in the workspace. So I've set up a correspondence between the title of each slide and uh, the way I have tagged the code for that. Okay, so you can match the code for a slide with the code that you have in that particular file. Okay, uh, so uh, if I step through the code here, you see x is 5, y is, y is 6, and you see here x is 5, y is 6. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, so if you want to step through the code, you can just go here and click on run. It has executed the first line, run, execute the second line, uh, you know, click on this, it executes the third line, and so on and so on. Okay, uh, so that's what we are doing here. Uh, so in this slide, I'm showing you how to manage the objects in the workspace. Now, what do we mean by objects in the workspace? If you look at our studio, I created a variable called x and gave it the value 5. I created another variable called y, gave it the value 6. And notice that these are two objects that I created. X and Y are two new objects that I created within R. And sure enough, those two new objects show up in the workspace. Okay, so that's what we're really talking about here. That as we work with R, we create a number of new objects. So for example, we read a data file into an R variable that's a new object within R. Okay, so those are the objects. So here I'm just in this slide, I'm talking about how do you manage the objects in the workspace? Okay, by managing the objects in the workspace, things like, okay, show me what are all the objects that are available. You can actually type the command ls, 
and R Studio will show you all the available objects in the workspace. So for example, uh, when we executed the command ls here by, by clicking here, I saw that it's showing us that the workspace now contains two objects called x and y. Okay, now this command uh, admittedly is not very useful when we're using R Studio because when we are using R Studio, we can look at the objects right away by going to the environment tab. You don't really need to use this command, right? So these commands are used when you're using R without using R Studio, which is sort of pointless now. It used to be the case before R Studio came out, uh, that is how we used to use R. But now that we have this environment, we really don't need to worry about this. Okay. Now to remove objects from the workspace, you can execute the command RM and then give the names of the objects you want to remove. In this case, I'm saying remove the two objects X and Y, RM X comma Y. But again, this is archaic. You don't need to do this. You can manage that right from the workspace itself. To do that, uh, you have to switch from the list view to the grid view. Okay, and in the grid view, you get check marks. So you can check these two, uh, the variables you want to remove, the objects you want to remove, and then you can use the broom to clean them up. Okay, so are you, want to, are you sure you want to remove the two objects? Yes, two objects are gone. Okay, now you may think, well, I, do I really need to delete these objects? Why don't I let them hang around? Yeah, for the most part, that's all right. But in the later parts of this course, we'll start using fairly big, uh, data sets. You know, for example, you might have a data set that's, you know, uh, 100 uh, megabytes big, 200 megabytes, huge data sets with hundreds of thousands of rows, right? In those cases, keeping those kinds of data loaded uh, will tend to slow down your system. Okay, so if you uh, created, if you read the data, you've done the processing, and now you're ready to move on to something else, why burden your system with all that extra load? Get rid of that object, okay? Of course, you may say, well, I don't want to delete it. I want to keep it. Then there are ways I'll show you of how you can save those objects. And then you can read them back as and when you need. Okay, so there's no point in just keeping them all the time in memory and burdening your computer. So that's why you might have to remove objects. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. So removing objects, you can do this, but just use R Studio, right? Go into the grid view, and then you can check and act on the selected objects. Okay, so now... Uh, it's time for us to take a look at some other data types, right? I'm saying other data types because there's one very important type of data that you've already used extensively in the last course, and that is the data frame, okay? So we have pretty much worked only with data frames. We have implicitly worked with some other data types, but I haven't really uh, emphasized any of those things so far. Let's get into those details right now. Okay, one important data type in R is what is called as a vector. Vector is nothing but a collection of other types, right? Collection of scalar types is what we call it. So for example, a vector might be a collection of the numbers 1, 10, 21, 5, and 7, a bunch of numbers, right? String is another collection, and string, of course, is character strings. And character strings in R can be enclosed in double quotes or in single quotes. They mean the same thing. Or you can have Boolean uh, items, which are the values true and false, also represented by uppercase T and F. Okay, we'll see where Boolean values are used. Boolean values are uh, truth values. So for example, if you look at a variable, and if you look at the condition, if the variable is X, and you say X less than five, that's a condition that could either be true or false. For example, if X is six, then X less than five is false because six is not less than five. On the other hand, if x is 1, x less than 5 is true, right? So Boolean variables are variables which represent truth or falsehood of some things. And they are sometimes referred to as predicates in logic. Okay, so these are uh, additional types of variables that we'll be working with. Okay, today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about vectors. Okay, uh, so vector is nothing but a sequence of data elements, all of which have the same type. Right? So within a vector, you can't put objects of different types. So for example, this is a vector. So names is the name of the vector. Right? It's a name. It's a variable. Names is a variable. And into that variable, we are putting a vector. Okay? And we are constructing the vector by using our familiar C function. Okay? C, lowercase c, not uppercase, because R is case sensitive. 
Uh, and then within parentheses, you just put in all the elements of the vector that you want. Notice that all the vector elements are strings because in R, a vector can only be uh, homogeneous. All the elements of the vector have to be of the same type. You know, for example, I cannot put Amanda and then 10 and 20 uh, in the same vector because Amanda is a string, 10 and 20 are integers. You can't put them in the same vector. Okay, and C is the function that you use to create vectors and it is really short for concatenate. So you're saying take all these elements, concatenate them and give me a vector. Notice that, of course, it's a function. So the arguments to the function are put within parentheses and uh, you separate the individual elements of the, of the argument by commas. Okay, so I'm creating another vector here. This time it's a vector consisting of numbers. Again, all of them are numbers. Right, and the numbers are 20, 40, 21, 32, 12. Now, incidentally, uh, in this example, I have shown you that all of these numbers are distinct. They're all different values, but that doesn't have to be the case. I can create a vector in which some of the elements are duplicated. Right, so I could say C within brackets, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Duplicates are allowed inside vectors. Okay, it's not a set that duplicates are not allowed. Okay, so I've created two vectors here, and of course, uh, the, they're stored in variables, just like uh, data frames or other things, but the value inside the variable is now a vector. Whereas if I had said x uh, is assigned the value 5, then x is a variable, the value inside that variable is not a vector, it's just an integer. I just put the value 5 into it. Okay, so variables can be assigned values of different types. Okay, now in R, you know that there are two ways in which you can assign values to variables. You can use the equal to operator, uh, which we did sometimes in the last class, or of course you use the assignment operator. Both of these have almost the same effect. Whatever is on the right hand side is computed and put into the variable on the left hand side. Right, so on the left hand side, I may say x equals five or x equals two plus three. Okay, so whatever is on the right hand side is going to get computed and it's going to get assigned to the variable on the left hand side, right? So in that sense, the equal to here is uh, not testing for mathematical equality. It is the assignment operator. Take whatever is on the right, assign it to the variable on the left. Okay, now this is also the assignment operator. And for practical purposes, so far as we are concerned in this course, these two are identical as far as this course goes. Uh, in, in real R, there's a very subtle difference between these two things, but that difference really need not concern us for this course.